All right, welcome everybody. Um, we are going to, in the next minute or so, let everybody trickle in from the waiting room. Uh, and in the meanwhile, I'll just uh, uh, go through some introductions and orientation for the program uh, so that we can get started right on time. Um, so just about a minute and we'll be good to go. Is it me or the computer start co stop cooperating at eight o'clock? All right, guys. So um, we're ready. Uh, it's eight o'clock. Welcome back to today's uh, edition of uh, the American Thoracic Society's COVID-19 Critical Care Training Forum. We get together every Tuesday from eight to nine p.m. on the Eastern Coast, and we talk about a new pertinent topic. We've been doing this uh, uh, from the early part of the pandemic, so it's great to be back with you guys. Today, we will be talking about airway management in uh, COVID-19. And so my name is Virena, I'm one of uh, the, uh, the Pompert physicians out in Krauss Health in uh, Syracuse. Uh, and with me, I have a fantastic crew. So it's being led by Dr. Kanal, who is, uh, like I was saying, our a Palm Crit fellow extraordinaire. I really, like I said, I was telling other participants, I wish I was like him when I was a fellow. Uh, I have Dr. Che, who is the Mayo Clinic Health Systems. Um, I don't know what I would do without her in my career. She has um, been a peer mentor in the world of airway medicine for me, and we are both very passionate about it. So, and I almost always learn something new when I talk to her about airways. So super excited for her. And on the side, she's also trained in emergency medicine. So we have that element of the interprofessional uh, sort of discussion today. We have Mr. Edwin Guerra, who is a respiratory therapist at Krauss Health, who leads the MICU ICU's uh, respiratory team. Uh, very has been very invested in care of the COVID-19 patients and the sort of policy updates uh, in the process. And then uh, last but definitely not the least is Dr. Uh, Catherine Heller, who is an anesthesia critical care um, attending and leads the uh, surgical ICU up in the University of Washington Medical Center, uh, who has been, um, I've already had a great time uh, talking to her, so I know you guys will learn a lot from her as well. I um, These are the disclosures uh, for uh, everybody who's been involved in planning the critical care training forum. Um, most of these exposures we do not believe are uh, of any direct link to this uh, webinar, so it should not be an interference. Um, I would strongly encourage you all to take a look at this um, um, QR code, scan it with your phone. It takes you to the uh, feedback site for um, our um, uh, critical care training, training forms uh, um, feedback page, like I said. It helps us sort of recalibrate what to do in the future, uh, cater to your interests. So please, uh, we strongly um, uh, you know, urge you or ask you to please fill this out. I want to bring your attention to the list of topics that we have covered in the ATS Critical Care Training Forum so far, uh, which has ranged everything from obstetrics and COVID-19 to cardiac issues and to uh, clots. I know everybody loves that topic to end of life care. Uh, you can find all of these if you uh, either Google ATS COVID-19 Forum or you go to this link, which we can share in the chat as well. Uh, and you can access all the 25 episodes and the uh, attached slides for most of them. Uh, the next topic that is coming up is the use of extracorporeal membranes oxy oxygenation in COVID-19, uh, also with a very stellar group of uh, faculty. So uh, we uh, you know, welcome you back next week for that. And finally, I want to give a big thanks to our uh, fantastic team um, who has put this forum together, Dr. Um, Alexander Shine uh, Krebs, as well as the resident team from uh, UCSD. And finally, our ATS staff, Lauren, Liz, Eileen, and Rebecca, who, like I was uh, mentioning earlier, have uh, kept this venture going from day one. So with that, I'm going to turn the screen over to Dr. Kanal, who's going to share some cases with you. So brought all yours. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Paul, for that introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Sabrat. I'm one of the uh, MICU Pulmonary Critical Care Fellows in SUNY Upstate, New York. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to talk about my experiences. So my uh, presentation is basically going to talk about what we face on a 
ground level day-to-day -day experience in the ICU from a fellow standpoint. I might not talk about a lot of data, but the stellar cast behind me is probably going to pitch in on that. And um, so here we go. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of cases that we had just a couple of weeks back. I was on the ICU service and uh, the wide variability of presentation and some of the airway challenges that we face. So as you know from the news, New York has uh, been uh, highlighted because of a lot of nursing homes. So we have these two nursing home patients, a 60 year old and a 70 year old. The first one's more of an orthopedic kind of mixed picture for past medical history. He had a lumbar spinal stenosis and was uh, paretic. And that was why he was in the nursing home. Uh, second guy is your typical uh, cardiovascular risk profile with the usual AFib, CAD, um, diabetes, hypertension, both coming in from the same nursing home around the same time, so two days apart. Exact same symptoms on presentation, worsening fever, cough, fatigue, which is the textbook of COVID. Um, and in the ED, found to be hypoxic, needing eight liters, which is our make you consult automatic. It's above six liters. Um, both were found to be COVID positive. Uh, so the course was very, very different. So the first guy um, had incidentally found to have bilateral non-massive PE, was started on therapeutic anticoagulation, thereafter admitted to medicine, uh, started on broad spectrum just for empiric coverage of a community acquired pneumonia as well, transferred to, to the ICU for high flow briefly after deterioration, but quickly back to medicine, and then discharged home on Lovenox in two liters after a couple of weeks inpatient stay, two negative COVID tests. And uh, both of these gentlemen received the cocktail of Decadron, Remdesivir, and Plasma, which we have the most data for currently. Um, the second gentleman was not so lucky. Um, he couldn't set well on the nasal cannula quickly onto high flow, was self-proning a bit, but uh, he was soon intubated for impending respiratory failure. Um, he was up on our unit already, and I did the intubation there. And it's usually with the COVID patients, we usually have to be prepared for jumping in for that airway at any time. And this is the pertinent part of this talk. Um, he developed septic shock and neuric AKI, was on uh, renal replacement therapy, and despite maximal support, uh, persistently acidotic, and the family withdrew care uh, in about a week and a half. So these are the images, CT scans from both the patients. This is patient A. You see these typical ground glass uh, diffusely, peripherally more on this gentleman, uh, mostly predominant on the upper lobes, but diffused nonetheless. And this is the scan on the second gentleman. More severe looking, more robust ground glass, basically not much of a pulmonary history on either of them. So coming to the challenges, uh, it's hard to practice in an area where the evidence is changing every day. Um, but the initial part of the first wave, this was a big concern, PPE availability and exposure to the staff. Um, negative pressure rooms were a big deal too. And the talks were to give the most experienced person the try. And that was usually anesthesia, but now we've stepped away from that. And we as fellows and sometimes residents do it as a normal case. So if there's a really difficult airway that's anticipated, then we call anesthesia for backup. Um, so PP is not that much of a big deal now, although the exposure part being constant vigilant is still everyone's responsibility. Then there are nuances in these things like pre-oxygenation. How do you pre-oxygenate someone successfully? Is there merit or is there a rationale of doing it continuously when they're maximally on oxygen, on high flow and have been that way and have gotten all underlying treatments, uh, including the remdesivir, decadron and plasma and not improving really. What you see on the monitor is a sat close to 90 on either side, maybe 88, maybe 85. And what do you do when you try to pre oxygenate but you're just not able to? And how much time do you spend on apneic ventilation when you deliver your meds? Um, it's always a challenge. Um, and then the usual determining factors of how a patient does intra intubation is mostly similar to what you do on other patients as well with the head positioning, the mom potty and the body habitus of the patient, 
the mask seal. And, and there's a shout out to all our awesome respiratory therapists here who help us with all of these things, including equipment gathering. Uh, but the, the functional residual capacity and the rate of oxygen consumption of these patients being on the sicker side of the spectrum is especially a bigger challenge to us. Um, coming to the sedation and paralysis. So the recommendations initially were RSI, whenever possible, we should get a par paralyzed patient on apneic ventilation where elimination of cough is the target um, so that they don't aerosolize um, and coming back to which modality you use on the high flow versus the bag mask. Either way, there's no clear cut evidence as far as I know and use of HEPA filter is big as well. Um, also, what we have to take into consideration is, is our equipment entirely with us uh, with a, a tube size of our choosing along with a backup smaller size the stylet, the syringe, the tube holder, the calorimeter, and or end tidal detector, oral airway, suction, and if something goes back, we uh, bad, we have to have an LMA or a bougie or something for backup and have someone on docera for outside communication so that anesthesia and ENT can get at bedside quicker if needed. So what's the talk on VL versus DL? So we usually start off with VL. Um, data has shown better rates of visualization of the cord in VL, but not necessarily first pass success rates. Um, but if the first VL is difficult because of secretions impairing our view, it's our standard practice just to go straight for the DL because the secretions are uh, better navigated through, in my experience, on the DL. Um, but that's my two cents on that. And then the confirmation, like any other intubation with the entitled the, calor the calorimeter, chest rise, breath sounds, oxygenation on the monitor, and obviously the filter has to be in place. But we have to be ready for post-intubation plan for sedation because these people need a lot of sedation and it's okay to over-sedate them initially. Later on, we can always come down and worry about venting desynchrony when we get there. Uh, hemodynamics is also a big part because these, these patients have such a high adrenergic drive and they're amped up. So when we uh, sedate them and paralyze them, all that drive goes down. You have vascular relaxation diffusely, and then you're adding positive pressure to the chest and beating venous return further. So these are things you have to have in mind and have maybe a bolus or two because initially fluids are needed, although COVID lungs are supposed to be on the drier side from our intervention standpoint but you have to do what you have to do initially. And pressors always in the room as well. So in summary, um, checklists and bundles do help. So whenever we admit a COVID patient, we just have a small checklist that we keep so that if in the case we need an intubation cart and a tray quickly at bedside, um, uh, we have all the equipment and personnel in the know. And keeping staff to a minimum, there's no point exposing everyone. So one respiratory therapist, one nurse, one physician, and maybe one assistant if need be. And then all the prep done outside and all the contingency equipment right outside. Again, RSI is preferable from my standpoint, wherever possible, unless there's a contraindication. Um, avoiding awake intubation and keeping the cough and the gag to a bare minimum. And then, like I said, the DL versus VL, start off with the VL and switch to DL as soon as you can, if you need to. All right. Thank you. I will hand over right. Dr. Paul. That gave us all a little typical anxiety with managing airways. So that's good. So we have uh, Dr. Che coming up next is going to detail a little bit more about why um, these airways are physiologically challenging. All right, Junior, good to go. All right, great. Oh, sorry. All right, hello everyone. My name is uh, June Che and I want to thank uh, Dr. Call for coordinating this webinar and for inviting me today. Uh, I'm a pulmonary and critical care doc uh, in the Mayo Clinic Health Systems and um, I am very honored to be here. 
So my portion of the talk uh, will address the physiologic challenges that are encountered during airway management uh, in, in the critically ill. I will focus on hypoxemia and uh, hemodynamic derangements and, the, and tie these principles into the management of COVID-19. Airway management is a common high-risk procedure in critically ill patients. The fourth national uh, audit project of the Royal College of Anesthetists and the Difficult Airway Society, i.e. the NAP4 report, uh, demonstrated that 25% of adverse airway events occurred in the ICU or in the ED. There are patient factors, both anatomic and physiologic, as well as human factors, uh, such as operator experience and team dynamics that come into play during airway management in the critically ill. So, as we know, ICU intubations are complicated. Critically ill patients represent the highest risk patients to intubate. Compared to OR intubations, ICU intubations have one in three potential severe complications, such as hypotension, hypoxemia, cardiac arrest, and death. Cardiac arrest occurs in about uh, four, two to four percent of uh, critically ill intubations. Desaturations occur in about 20 to 40 percent, and hypotension occurs in about 10 to 40 percent of ICU intubations. This uh, table from a prospective observational study um, by uh, Hypes et al. Um, demonstrates the proportion of complications by number of, of attempts. As you can see here, um, the intubation-related complications increased about 40% after the first attempt, and by the fifth attempt, all patients experienced at least one complication. The most common complication was desaturation, which occurred more frequently if uh, first attempt success was not achieved. Um, and in the study, after controlling for pot potential confounders, hypoxemia, hemodynamic instability, airway edema, and uh, a soiled airway, um, i.e. presence of vomit, uh, were the difficult airway characteristics significantly associated with higher odds of a first attempt complication. So I'd really like to point out that despite first attempt success, about 25% 20, 20 of uh, patients had an intubation-related complication here, highlighting the increased um, difficult airway correct characteristics that are present uh, in the critically ill. Hence, the goal is not always first, it is first attempt success, but first attempt success uh, without complications. Dejong et al. identified uh, five independent risk factors to predict intubation related cardiac arrest with three potential uh, modifiable risk factors, such as hypoxemia prior to intubation, um, absence of preoxygenation, as well as uh, hemodynamic failure prior to intubation. Patient characteristics associated with cardiac arrest were BMI greater than 25 and um, age greater than 75 years old. So as you can see, there are many factors that contribute to difficulty in the ICU, such as the emergent nature of a lot of these airways, limiting our ability to adequately assess the airway, pre-existing cardiopulmonary disease, we talked about hemodynamic instability and hypoxemia, a full stomach um, diverse clinical considerations, not just COVID-19. So your increased ICP, your myocardial ischemia, uh, obesity, and then of course our current reality, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So just a brief a bit on the clinical course of COVID-19. It's thought to have uh, the viral replication phase, um, and if it progresses into more severe forms, then uh, jumps into a hyperinflammatory phase. And in the ICU, we oftentimes see these patients. Uh, they, they're hypoxemic. They require escalating uh, non-invasive respiratory support, as well as mechanical ventilation. Uh, and, the, and in the most critical cases, we will see refractory hypoxemia, shock, multi-organ dysfunction, and although hypoxemia is something that we encounter uh, more often with COVID-19, we don't always encounter significant uh, hypotension. And so, and hypotension and shock state may be encountered in this hyperinflammatory state, and we need to take that into account when planning for our intubation strategy. So um, as we can see, and as we've experienced in our, in our practice, we're up against various physiologic challenges in the ICU, such as hypoxemia from VQ mismatch and shunt physiology, hypotension, severe metabolic acidosis and right ventricular failure. Uh, and these, cha these challenges increase the incidence of adverse events leading to dangerous hypoxemia, hemodynamic collapse, and ultimately uh, cardiac arrest. The, uh, and this baseline physiologic risk is exaggerated when intubations require more than one attempt, hence the uh, utmost importance of first pass success and optimizing these physiologic variables as much as we can. <laughs> 
Applying this to COVID-19, um, a lot of times the respiratory failure is related to significant airspace disease, hypoxemia, and shunt physiology. If we're in the inflammatory phase of the disease or if the patient presents with cardiomyopathy or poorly perfusing arrhythmia, which we can see with COVID-19, we will struggle against hypotension. And if the patient presents to you with acute renal failure from COVID-19, you could also see metabolic acidosis. And if they have a hemodynamically significant clot burden from PE or ARDS causing increased RV afterload, then there is increased concern for the greatly feared uh, RV failure. Uh, none of us likes that. And so um, with all these factors in mind, the question we need to ask ourselves is, can safe apnea be achieved? And in order to an help answer that question, we need to discuss pre-oxygenation. So the ultimate goal of pre-oxygenation is to increase uh, safe apnea time by increasing the oxygen reservoir of the FRC um, through denitrogenation. Gas in our lungs is stored in the space defined by uh, the FRC. And uh, factors affecting FRC include body size, uh, sex, age, posture, um, habitus. And, um, and as you see here, most of our alveolar gas while breathing room air is composed of nitrogen. When breathing 100% oxygen, the alveolar nitrogen gets washed out and replaced with oxygen, thus progressively building up an oxygen storage in that FRC we just talked about. And in order to effectively denitrogenate, you need a tight-fitting mask, which will eliminate entrainment of room air. Hence, it's important to note that changes in FRC, such as due to obesity or pregnancy, for example, can have a sizable impact on the oxygen reservoir within the lungs and on the efficacy of um, preoxygenation. Thus, patients with reduced FRCs will have re reduced oxygen reserves uh, despite preoxygenation and are at increased risk of desaturation during the apnea period with airway management. So, um, Pre-oxygenation is strongly recommended before intubation in the operating room, of course, and its importance is even more pronounced in the ICU where patients often present with oxygen transport limitations and are likely to require more time with airway management. Mort demonstrated that after high flow bag valve mask uh, pre-oxygenation of four minutes, patients with healthy lungs prior to elective surgery increased their PO2 from about high 70s to 400 uh, millimeter mercury. Whereas for hypoxemic ICU patients intubated for respiratory failure, the PAO2 increased from the 60s to the high 80s, so a notable difference. Preoxygenation increases the pulmonary reservoir of oxygen, as we discussed, which can increase your safe apnea time. And the safe apnea time depends on the size of your FRC, your oxygen consumption, degree of shunt. And as you can see here, there's significantly less reservoir of oxygen and thus less time for intubation in the critically ill due to derangements with likely increased oxygen consumption and shunt fraction. This graph by Benyamov shows the SAO2 versus the uh, time of apnea uh, after maximal preoxygenation in an obese adult, a normal 10 kilogram child, uh, both of whom have low functional residual capacities and high oxygen consumption, a moderately ill 70 kilogram adult uh, compared to healthy 70 kilogram adult. As you see, the obese uh, adult and 10 kilogram child encounter the steep portion of the, uh, the curve early. Uh, critically ill patients have a lower starting SAO2 compared to the normal 70 kilogram adult likely due to increased severity of airspace disease, rate of O2 consumption, and decrease FRC, ultimately decreasing the safe apnea time. The goal is to put our patients on the plateau part of the curve as much as possible. If you try to intubate while the patient is on the steep portion of the hemoglobin desaturation curve, you will likely encounter clinically significant hypoxemia. You'll have to abort your first attempt, and we know that this is associated with increased adverse events. So this equation posited by T Tanubi and colleagues demonstrates that uh, safe apnea time directly depends on the size of FRC, i.e. how big your reservoir is. Uh, the degree of denitrogenation, i.e. how much oxygen is in that reservoir, and it's inversely related to oxygen consumption, i.e. how fast you deplete that reservoir. Uh, in your critically ill patients, the worse the shunt fraction is, the less the oxygen is available to you, which is what we see in our critically ill patients and our COVID-19 patients as well. 
So we will now move on to uh, hemodynamics. Uh, and we know that hemodynamic instability is an independent uh, predictor of death after uh, intubation. Post-intubation hypotension occurs in about half of ICU intubations and is associated with longer ICU stays as well as death. Hefner et al. found that cardiac arrest complications occurred in about 4% of intubations, uh, of uh, rapid sequence intubations, with PEA as the most common presenting rhythm. Two-thirds of those occurred within 10 minutes of pushing RSI drugs. Uh, the shock index. So first described in 1967, actually, uh, this the index provides an estimation of hemodynamic status and is easily calculated at bedside, as you see, as heart rate over systolic blood pressure. The normal range is between 0.5 to 0.7. Uh, shock index here greater than or equal to 0.9. Um, there is a it's associated with a higher inpatient mortality. Uh, if, if the index is greater than or equal to one, uh, this predicts a post intubation arrest. So as you can see, the shock index is, is useful. It can, it's a pragmatic tool in predicting inpatient mortality and post-intubation arrest, but it's not entirely reliable. Um, about 30% 30, 30 of patients um, with a normal shock index can have cardiovascular collapse or hypotension after intubation. Uh, the utility of this index uh, has limitations in certain populations, such as in the elderly, uh, your febrile patient, or those with chronic hypertension on chronic medications such as beta blockers or antihypertensives uh, who may not have a consistent change in the heart rate or blood pressure. And these conditions have been uh, shown to alter the association of shock index and mortality. Another score that came out this year was developed by Schmishny et al. Uh, and this group looked at developing a prospective score and risk factors for post-intubation hypotension called the HYPE score for hypotension prediction score and the S-HYPES score for the stable cohort of patients who were not on vasopressors prior to intubation. As you can see here, these are the variables they uh, took into account. You can assign a, a score to each one of these factors and then classify into low, moderate, high, or very high risk of developing hypotension or odds of hypotension. And uh, I know we've all heard of the PREPARE trial, um, the multi-center randomized control trial by Jans et al., um, where patients were randomized to a fluid bolus group of 500 cc's versus no bolus. And as you can see here, there was no difference in the primary endpoints of uh, new hypotension, of uh, systolic pressure less than 65, new or increased vasopressor use, um, and uh, two minutes after intubation, or cardiac arrest within an hour, uh, and death within an hour of intubation. The, on average, the fluid bolus arm received about 200 cc's of fluid. Uh, the fluid was initiated prior to intubation, but in most cases, only half of the, the fluid was able to go in. Uh, and I think this actually applies to the, the reality of most of our intubating conditions, uh, where we say, run the fluids open, but not all of it gets in. And so hence the pragmatic nature of this trial. Uh, and in general, fluid boluses take time effects are short-lived, and unless there is true hypovolemia, uh, fluids are relatively uh, inefficient. If you want more bang for your buck, um, start vasopressors to prevent peri-intubation hypotension. Vasopressors are faster, they are titratable, and you can avoid fluid overload and toxicity. So how do we optimize the hemodynamics? If your patient's actually hypovolemic, give some fluids. Uh, you can certainly utilize um, ultrasound to, for fluid um, to assess fluid responsiveness too. And in most cases, um, utilize vasopressors give it, and give adjusted doses of induction agents uh, and preferentially choose a more hemodynamically neutral agent such as atomidate or even ketamine. So this is um, a nice slide from Mosier, Mosier et al. from the Blue Journal from this year with recommendations on pre-oxygenation as well as hemodynamics depending on the risk of decompensation. I won't delve too much into it as Dr. Heller uh, will be addressing pre-oxygenation strategies during her portion of the talk. Um, and just a brief comment on airway management during COVID-19. Uh, within the timeline of this pandemic itself, there has been significant variation among uh, the utilization of non-invasive ventilation uh, as well as uh, high flow nasal, nasal cannula um, around the world. Uh, a lot of this variability has been driven by the concern for infection spread, um, which uh, Mr. Guerra will be talking about where initially we were intubating early, uh, and now the pendulum has uh, shifted towards utilizing more non-invasive measures 
Um, and e here, as you see, even the Difficult Airway Society has said um, avoid aerosol generating uh, procedures, including high flow nasal cannula and non invasive ventilation early on as well. And I would say airway management in the critically ill uh, patient with COVID-19 should adhere to core uh, pre-existing principles with assessing both difficult anatomic and physiologic factors, preparing and planning backup strategies and salvage strategies, utilizing a cognitive aid such as a checklist, uh, especially given the high cognitive burden and stress of COVID-19 airway management, and using clear and effective communication with your team. The key difference now is utilizing appropriate PPE uh, filters and minimizing personnel in the room. I would say, so some take-home take -home points are the intubation of critically ill patients is a high-risk procedure. Uh, key physiologic challenges include hypoxemia and hypotension, both of which can increase risk for cardiac arrest. Pre-oxygenation is key to increase safe apnea time, which is dependent on size of FRC, denitrogenation of that FRC, and oxygen consumption, and adhering to core pre-existing airway management principles with strict adherence to appropriate PPE in the COVID era is of the utmost importance. Thank you for joining us today. Stay safe out there. And here is uh, Mr. Guerra on infection mitigation strategies. Edwin, you're good to uh, share your slides, back, my friend. So while uh, Edwin's pulling up his slides, uh, do you mind or say if I just ask for a quick clarification? You were talking about, you know, uh, the steep fall of the oxygen curve. But the fact is that we don't have a great idea about how, say, critically ill, hypoxic, more than overweight patients would do, right? Or do you do you have literature to share on that? Because I think that's the most I feel like at risk population. We there is clearly demonstrated link link between obesity and COVID nineteen, and and if a non obese person is gonna become hypoxic in a minute, I think the biggest challenge is how to get that less than that. Yeah, agreed. Um, I mean, in the interest of time, um, um, I don't have a study to quote off right now off the top of my head, but uh, you know, yes, if, uh, obesity is clearly a risk factor for, um, for uh, desaturation, especially with that decreased FRC. Um, positioning clearly plays a role here in your obese patients as well. I think it's, it's identifying the risks and predicting it um, because I think, uh, you know, our obese patients are at risk for COVID-19 infections as well. So I think um, being able to identify and predict and plan is key. And I'll, um, I'll uh, let Mr. Guerra get onto his uh, presentation. Thank you. All right, Edwin, good to go. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Call, and uh, everyone in the team for putting this together. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk today about um, healthcare worker safety during uh, COVID-19. Um, I'm going to talk for about some uh, general precautions, uh, most fundamental def defense against this virus or viruses is uh, donning and doffing. Both uh, CDC and uh, American Society of Anesthesiologists recommend that uh, uh, airborne and contact precautions uh, should be put and uh, including eye pro eye, eyewear protection. Uh, PPE usually includes uh, N95, N95 or paper, uh, face shield or goggles, gown and gloves. It, uh, uh, it's very important that, uh, or very essential actually, hand washing before and after we don in and doff in. Uh, negative pressure room or HIPAA filter should be effective for uh, every institution as much as possible. And also we should, we should use MDIs versus uh, aerosol because uh, we know aerosolizing these uh, medication um, can uh, increase the, the particles in the room and uh, 
will be more um a second. And uh, so with the filters, we're going to talk about safe uh, circuitry. We have, um, we should put filters in uh, inspiratory and expiratory limbs of the ventilator, as well as the back valve mask. Heat and moisture exchanger filters, they are rated to remove at least 97, 99% of these airborne particles. With... Um, with the use of uh, non-invasive or, or like high flow nasal cannulas, we should use uh, scavenger devices. These are intended to create like a negative pressure area around our patient's uh, face. They're usually connected to wall suction or a vacuum system. And uh, they may help ca capture these infectious particles. And we should uh, also minimize circuit disconnection and limit the exposure in the room. Uh, as far as the exposure in the room, we should do more of a bundle care and we should have a dedicated airway team that's gonna enter the room. Uh, here are some uh, pictures of the HIPAA filters. Uh, put both on uh, inspiratory and expiratory sides of the limb of the ventilator. And here we have a back valve mask with a HIPAA filter. This is a picture of the scavenger. Um, the patient here has a high flow nasal cannula on. And this is a scavenger, which is like I said, hooked up to negative pressure and it's supposed to collect some particles and may help to collect these uh, infectious particles and uh, decrease exposure. As far as air, airway equipment, we should have a uh, designated COVID-19 airway packages. And uh, we should uh, avoid taking the whole airway cart in the room. This way we don't waste material. And uh, we should have an airway plan, which is, uh, will be best. And we'll have a close communication with airway operator and bedside RN or a code team. Always have a runner outside the room for uh, anything that we need to, to bring inside the room. There is a picture here for the room and equipment uh, setup. As you can see, inside the room, we have a team which uh, should consist of about four or five uh, people. And the runner is outside that can bring us whatever we need. There's an emergency tracheal intubation kit here on the right, which consists of, consists of uh, intubation material that must be needed. Like I said before, not everything should be put in the room just so we don't uh, waste material. Uh, Always the question was, what can we use as far as devices? In the beginning, we were actually told not to use high flows or non-invasive ventilators, but uh, now we're using both of these devices just to avoid intubation. High flow nasal cannulas, we use them, like I said, with the whether a scavenger or you can just put a mask over the patient's face. On the non-invasive ventilators, we can use a filter in the inspiratory limb as well in the in the exhalation port, and uh, we can both we can use these two devices, I think, freely as long as we are in a negative pressure room and uh, we limit our time in the room. On the ventilators, we just uh, 
add both filters in both uh, circuits. And uh, we try to avoid any disconnections, whether there is water in the tubing or something, we can't really disconnect these patients. Or if we're going to a transport, we gotta be really careful going just to not uh, disconnect. Uh, I'm going to close this uh, talk by saying your personal protection is the priority here. So let's uh, let's all uh, be safe and uh, done and off properly and uh, take our time before we go in the room and uh, limit the time inside the room. Fantastic, Thank you very much. Edwin, I think that's uh, two big points is safety, uh, knowing what kind of equipment you need, uh, limiting exposure by bundling care. We've, this has come up multiple times in the COVID-19 critical care forum that, you know, at peak at, at peak of a pandemic or during, uh, you know, stress periods, uh, the standard of care is hard to maintain. But I think sticking to some of these basic principles that you brought up for safety does allow us to do that to a significant degree. So thanks for sharing that, Edwin. All right. And then we have Dr. Heller coming up. Um, and Dr. Heller, while you're uh, sharing the screen, I think um, one, uh, I saw a question come up about the maximum settings on high flow. So I just wanted to remind you about addressing that as you come on for your talk. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. My name is Catherine Heller. I am an assistant professor at the University of Washington and an anesthesiologist and critical care physician, the medical director for the surgical ICU, which during our first wave switched over to a COVID ICU. I'm going to be talking about airway management and critically ill COVID-19 patients. Some of uh, my slides have already been covered by the excellent presenters, so I really want to focus on practical considerations for how we can safely manage these airways and how to establish some of these goals. I have no disclosures. We're gonna talk about staff safety, patient factors and timing, adjuncts for oxygenation, and it seems like there's a lot of questions about non-invasive ventilation and high flow particularly, and then the basics of intubation procedures and preparation and what to do in an unusual or difficult situations. Um, I want to start, if we can, briefly, um, and Brian, I don't know if you'd mind putting that link in the um, in the chat, but if you guys will go to the link for this poll everywhere, I just was wondering of the audience. Um, Would uh, you mind showing us the link so I can put it in the poll? It's right there. It's poll everywhere. Mm -hmm. Pollev.com. Let me put it for everybody. Uh, to see uh, what the practice experiences of people who are on this call with us with particular attention to airway. So it should be open now. There we go. And this just says, I have been or will be responsible for airway management of known or suspected COVID-19 patients. And yes or no. Um, we won't say spend too long on this, but I think a lot of our audience probably is intubating COVID-19 patients. It's so, you know, we're having such a terrible wave currently that they're very common. Um, especially even in smaller medical centers. And um, thank you guys for participating. I'll wait just another 10 seconds and then move on to the next one because the particular, the next question is gonna be about who is intubating in your centers. So are you um, intubating with anesthesia providers, ICU providers, a specialized team, or some sort of combo model? Um, at my institution, anesthesiologists are intubating all of the out-of-OR airways, but I think that is not a common model. I think mostly it is our ICU providers who are intubating these patients, um, though some places have de uh, dedicated teams. Like about half and half. And then finally, is there a practice pattern for video laryngoscopy, GlideScope, McGrath, CMAC versus direct laryngoscopy or no specific pattern that you know of? Again, yeah. 
a lot of video laryngoscopy. So moving on to discussing airway management. The first priority is staff safety. It's already been covered a bit, but I do want to touch on procedural planning. So appropriate PPE takes time. We've already heard some talks about donning and doffing. If you've had personal experience with this, doing this well takes time. And so avoiding emergencies is key. And I want to uh, encourage your facilities to consider rounding remotely or in person on known COVID patients. If patients are on high flow, BiPAP, a significant supplemental oxygen are in the ICU, but not yet intubated, we like to keep an eye on those patients with particular attention to how difficult we think their airways will be. I've also encouraged my nursing staff to think of themselves as first responders. One of the changes in the COVID era that we've found is that if someone has an emergency, cardiac arrest, an airway emergency, sudden desaturation, the nurse may be the only one in the room for a surprisingly long amount of time and they need some skills to handle that in terms of a refresher on bag mask ventilation, assistance with um, supplementing oxygen because the Calvary coming may take a couple minutes to get donned appropriately. Um, airway management is uh, it's refreshingly clear. It's an air about what kind of PPE you need. It's an aerosol generating procedure. You need respirator level protections with airborne or contact droplet. There's a lot of different ways this can look. Choose what works for you and your facility. The most important thing is having a protocol and clear donning and doffing procedures. N95s and PAPRs are both used. I have a preference for PAPRs uh, for comfort level because we sometimes do cases in the ORs and you're in them for many hours. Uh, but they're uh, a scarce resource. Not everyone, you know, no facility has enough PAPRs for every single provider. Um, they're more comfortable to protect the face, but they do require a power source um, and need more assistance to don and doff. N95 is far easier, allow, or a little bit allow the use of a stethoscope, um, but maybe less comfortable and they just don't fit everybody in an appropriate fashion. Um, these barrier devices come up frequently. Uh, I personally do not recommend them. So there was a, as a large body of literature with sort of preliminary versions of various barrier devices to try and limit contamination. The trick is that they're not a replacement for PPE. Uh, there's a, a, also a pretty decent body of literature, but, um, even with early Chinese experience that with appropriate PPE, there is never zero risk, but there are not large case reports of um, contracting COVID inappropriate PPE during intubation procedures. So we do think that true respirator PPE is likely to be sufficient for personal protection. And so these barrier devices are an encumbrance without a proven benefit. There's um, a study by Bagley um, examining these devices that found greater breaches of PPE and greater um, risk of failed airway. Um, even um, if they are used and the FDA revoked the emergency use authorization for these devices in August. So um, we are not using them. I don't recommend them. I think one of the things is that with the increased mental load of PPE and the concerns about COVID, it's really a back to basic strategy with the principles of safe airway management that sort of more you can streamline the better. Um, there are certainly individual and facility related uh, factors that may make their use appropriate, but um, I don't recommend them for everyone. Um, priority number two is getting the patient oxygen. It's a challenge. So when to intubate is um, a moving target as a couple of people have discussed. Early in the pandemic, like many centers, we were intubating quite early. Um, as we started to see patient accrue harm from mechanical ventilation, um, we're now trying to find that balance between harm from early intubation and early mechanical ventilation that may not have been necessary and then on the other side, harm from crash, emergency intubations, cardiac arrests, which is also a real risk to the patient. Um, earlier New York-based studies showed really high mortalities and a suggestion of higher mortality for delayed intubation, but uh, more recent literature, and I have references at the end, show um, really no difference in mortality with uh, later intubation. So later intubation, either based on time from ICU admit to intubation or delayed intubation with tactics like high flow nasal cannula or um, BiPAP, non-invasive ventilation. Um, about 75% of patients admitted with um, ARDS are going to need mechanical ventilation. Um, and the overall mortality in more recent studies has hovered around 30%. So what about high flow nasal cannula and BiPAP? What to do? Major airway society or major societies have recommended against aerosol generating um, procedures and devices in rooms that are not negative pressure. That said, 
most larger institutions have moved to using high flow nasal cannula in BiPAP in select cases. Ideally, it should occur in a negative pressure room. You've got to do what's right for you and your facility. But the review I just cited and two others find that about um, 30 to 40% of patients put on high flow nasal cannula um, may actually avoid intubation and that mortality is not higher in patients who have high flow nasal cannula before intubation. So uh, we do use it if it can be done safely with the sort of negative pressure or scavenging and careful attention to PPE. I do think there are as a small selective group of patients that do benefit from that. And, um, but the real uh, thing I want to touch on is that if they're in use, continue. Continue them around the time of intubation. Hypoxemia is extremely common during intubation of COVID-19 patients. As nu um, numerous other speakers have touched on, if you're already on 100% high flow at 60 liters, there's nowhere else to go. It's gonna be hard, even with mask ventilation, to deliver any higher FiO2 until you can have a closed circuit and high pressures. Um, the risk of hypoxemia for COVID patients, even in experienced operators, was greater than 70% in one study. And patients who are hypoxemic are gonna decide immediately when they become apneic. Um, so how to accomplish apneic oxygenation. If they have BiPAP or high flow nasal cannula already attached, turn it up to 100% and leave it on. Consider leaving the high flow on throughout intubation if it's nasal and not in your way. Obviously the BiPAP is gonna have to come off but know that you will not do better than that. Um, and it really comes down to speed at that point and having a good plan. Uh, bag mask ventilation, also aerosol generating. I do avoid it if I can, but often I can't. I think the reality is that CPR is also an aerosol generating procedure. And that if someone becomes apneic and has profound desaturations, most providers are going to attempt bag mask ventilation. So then I think we should try a harm reduction strategy with a two hand mask, a good seal, a filter in line and ideally two operators, one with a two hand mask, one squeezing um, with an open airway uh, to try and limit tidal volumes and limit pressures. Uh, speed matters like we talked about and RSI is, is currently recommended by most major societies. You should do what makes sense in the clinical situation, but realize that rapid sequence intubation is just what it sounds. It's pushing the meds very quickly. It does not necessarily mean you have to avoid um, ventilation. It just means that you should push whatever your sedative induction agent and your paralytic back to back quickly. Uh, and that I do recommend. Priority number three, have a plan and a backup plan. So don't forget the basics. A good, uh, one of the things that we've discovered about COVID airways is we're all doing a little bit more uh, for ourselves than we would have done in a resource rich environment where you can call in people from the hallway if things get difficult. So be sure that you have good IV access with a free flowing IV, which means it's dripping to gravity. That way your sedative and vasopressors and everything will flow into the patient without someone having to actively push them in, which there may not be an extra pair of hands at the time. Consider having your sedatives and vasopressors in line. And um, as some of our other speakers talked about, I'll often have my norepi drip set up before I induce set it about, I don't know, 0.02 to 0.04 mics per kilo per minute and turn it on at the first sign of hypotension. Um, have suction easily available. Have your standard monitors on, EKG, blood pressure, cycling uh, frequently every three minutes, pulse ox that's audible, ideally. Sometimes the papers interfere with that. Monitor turn towards you in some way of reliably measuring end tidal CO2. It's a good time for a checklist. Um, Equipment. So I, uh, the video laryngoscope may, may aid in first pass success. The literature is a little um, mixed on that. I do think there's benefit, though, to even a better visualiz visualization. Other people in the room can see what you see. If you have difficulty visualizing, if you have an unexpected difficult airway, it can help with having someone else to communicate the problem outside of the room because communication can be limited. Video laryngoscope may theoretically help you maintain some physical distance from the patient as well. As we talked about, the operator should think about functioning with minimal assistance. There may be only two or three people in the room to be able to um, stylet your own tubes, inflate your own cuffs, have a plan for how you would do this independently and consider indication drug or drug packs. So we have an equipment tray and a separate drug tray or drug pack. Um, and when I go in to intubate uh, a relatively new admit COVID patient, I'll often also have this set up for an arterial line intubation 
and center line in that order. I just push the trays in ahead of me as I, after I've donned and go into the room. Um, make sure you assign roles and verbalize a backup plan out loud. It's difficult to communicate in these rooms uh, and you want to have not only your primary plan, but what everyone's role will be if that plan does not go well. So you can move directly to that. As we talked about, you're really against a clock um, in these airways, especially if they've been on high flow or BiPAP at high FiO2s. And there's not gonna be a ton of time to switch to a next tactic. So make sure everybody knows what to hand you and what you're doing next. And that would look something like, if I fail my first video learning scope, I'm going to move directly to direct laryngoscopy. If I can't get a view, I'll place an oral airway to hand bag mask while calling for additional help and just move quickly through it. Um, I have a general rule that the more difficult I think the airway is going to be, the more equipment gets opened. Um, and that's to help, again, minimize the happening. This is just a general tip. It often seems easier to intubate patients in the operating room, and it definitely is for a variety of reasons. Often people are just healthier and have easier airways, but one of the major differences is positioning. We pay as careful attention to positioning in the operating room and the sniffing position with flexion at the, at the neck, at the cervical spine, and then extension at the atlanto-occipital joint with elevation of the ear to near the sternum is really helpful in successful intubation and mass ventilation and often missed in the ICU with softer beds and difficult positioning. Consider a ramp or reverse T-berg in your obese patients, both to help um, optimize your FRC as much as possible, get that weight off the diaphragm, as well as um, helping with intubating itself. The drugs really depend on patient situation. Atomidate and ketamine are both very reasonable choices. If you're using propofol, the key is to dramatically dose reduce. If a normal dose of propofol for an operating room induction would be two milligrams per kilogram, one milligram per kilogram, or even less may be enough, all you're looking to do is induce unconsciousness. Um, Racuronium versus succinylcholine also depends on the patient situation. Some patients are not candidates for succinylcholine because of hyperkalemia, um, concerns for de-innervation, et cetera. Uh, succinylcholine is, is slightly better at creating better intubating conditions faster, even than RSI dose rocuronium. So I do occasionally use succinylcholine if I think there's just very little time to work with. It does cause defasciculation. Um, if you do elect to use succinylcholine, have a long-acting neuromuscular blockade available, rocuronium, cystochrome, what have you, in case that patient is having difficulties with um, BQ matching, difficulties with compliance, and having a significant um, trouble ventilating on the vent right after intubation. And then, like we talked about, uh, consider bundling care with placing lines and maybe even uh, proning at the time this sort of all happens if you know that they're going to be difficult to oxygenate and ventilate on the vent in advance. Um, complications are common, hypoxemia in the 70s, hypotension at least 10%. One case review um, had pneumothorax in, um, at a 6%, which is considerably higher than other ARDS complications. Point of care ultrasound can be helpful here to quickly check for lung sliding before a chest x-ray can make its way into the room. Cardiac arrest, uh, seems to be um, on at least one large review of 200 intubations for COVID patients around 2%, which is about similar to other um, ICU intubations. And then I think we found um, at the time of intubation that worsening BQ match can um, precipitate the need for paralysis and proning. Um, for difficult airways, adjust your preparation based on the perceived difficulty. I assess airways based on anesthetic airway history, malum potty score, history of sleep apnea, weight, thyromental distance, mouth opening, awake fiber optic is generally not recommended. Um, I will say that one of the truisms of this pandemic is that every time I say it, that won't happen, it immediately happens. But um, tra and tracheostomy is a good example of that. We're doing tracheostomies, most centers are. Um, it's essentially treated as a COVID positive um, OR case, which there's a pretty good body of literature now. Um, Keep in mind that the difficulty of airway, uh, any one factor is not a good predictor of a difficult airway. It's really the combination. And as you start to accumulate negative predictors, the airway becomes more and more difficult, to, uh, likely to be difficult. Adjuncts. Uh, the ED literature has a significant background in, in using bougies 
uh, anesthesia less so. So it's not my primary tool. I use it as a rescue, but there, um, there's a reasonable body of literature that says it increases first pass success in experienced operators who may need a second operator. LMAs are a good rescue tool. It may improve your seal. It may give you time. Um, it's not a definitive airway, but absolutely use an LMA to rescue. I'm going to skip the summary and say that's it. Um, the only last tip I would say is that the greater, you, the more difficult you think an error will be, the more you should consider slightly earlier intubation so that you can involve local experts in planning and do it in a fully resourced environment rather than sort of the overnight emergency. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Heller. That was awesome. That was, uh, that was Airway 101 in, in, let's say, 15 minutes. I love it. All right, so I, you know, the nice thing is, I think we were able to address questions as we went along, but um, if there are any questions, now would be a good time to ask. Uh, there was this one question, which sort of doesn't pertain to our talk, but you kind of touched on it. It was about if you have to prone people who are mechanically ventilated and you're resource limited and you cannot necessarily prone them, are there any positions, um, you know, any thoughts on that? Yeah, there's old literature on chest weight. Um, that turn to try essentially and force distension of your posterior lung fields and prevent over distension of your anterior lung fields. I've never tried it myself, um, but I've had attendants who tried it in training. Right. You can always also head down a patient sometimes. Again, you know, with the heavier lung up, I guess, is the idea, but I, I don't think we have literature. Uh, plus, there's there was the, that recent study that came out which showed that awake intubation, uh, sorry, awake proning may not be yeah. as effective as we were hoping for, which was broke my heart a little bit. But um, here's another actually interesting question because I know uh, this has come up in the past as well. So there are a few endotracheal tubes out there with better first pass profiles. Uh, have you found out one that you like? You know, I haven't. I don't have a, a huge preference. I haven't had a big issue. I will say we use um, micro, we use something called MLTs for really difficult airways that are small and longer. So they're essentially small tubes size for adults because our small tubes tend to start getting shorter as if they're for a smaller person. Uh, and those are very helpful as a rescue. So like a 5.0 MLT, if you just can't get anything in them is very helpful. Uh, other than that, I haven't noticed a huge difference. I think if I'm having trouble advancing, I usually do go to a bougie at that point with that interior deflection, get the bougie in and then advance over. That makes sense. Um, and we'll take this one last question. So should high flow nasal cannula only be used in negative pressure chambers? Yeah, I agree with um, Dr. Chang. Uh, ideally negative pressure, but it's used widely. Right. You know, as long as you have adequate PPE, and uh, I think Dr. Chase answered it, uh, you know, have a mask over it, uh, which, um, you know, uh, sort of protects the, because there, there's that study with that very nice graphic, which shows that once you put the mask on the high flow, it kind of cuts off that uh, variable uh, dispersion. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Che, uh, Erin, Dr. Kanal, Dr. Heller, fantastic. Um, it was a good revision for me as well. Um, and so a little post-board uh, revision on airway management. So thank you for taking time out. Thank you everybody for your questions. Just a reminder, this uh, session is accredited for a CME. So, um, uh, you know, you'll get an email, I believe. And uh, if you can just respond to that uh, and please do remember to fill out the survey um, uh, uh, that, you know, will give us an idea about what to cover in the future talks. So with that, thank you everybody and have a good night. Bye guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Good night.